Okay. What we don't know entirely is, is VO2 max important for exercise or who wins a race? Okay. I will now present you back to some data that we showed on the very first part of class. Very famously, David Costco testing some of the, the Olympians in the 70s. And what you can see is here's their names. Okay. Never get away with this now in uh, in today's world. HIPAA violation to all across these things. Height, weight, VO2 max, max heart rate. Okay. Best performance time 400 meters, one mile, three miles, six mile marathon. Okay. Then we have what are middle distance runners, collegiate middle distance runners, and then these untrained men. VO2 max of 77, VO2 max of 70, right? And then you look and you say, okay, well, they were about the same at 400 meters. The guys were better. The Olympians were better at the mile. They're better at three miles. They're better at six miles. And they have higher VO2 maxes, okay? Is that, we don't even have these data in our training room because we know they've kicked their ass. So based upon that, do we think, does VO2 max matter? Can I draw that conclusion from these data? So Zion, what do you think? Can I draw that conclusion? They have a higher VO2 max. They ran these longer distance things faster, right? It's got to be new. Can we say that? So Olympians, VO2 max of 77. Collegiate middle distance runners, VO2 max of 70. Good, right? Very good, not quite as high. And then you look at their one mile time, three mile time, six mile time. The Olympians are faster. All of those somewhat kind of aerobically dependent distances. So can we say they're faster here because their VO2 max is high? No, why not? Okay, we're not taking into account what happens at the muscle. Okay, are there things at the muscle though that happen that contribute to the VO2 max that we already just talked about? I know I'm being a total pain. It's the last day of class, you'll have to afford me to do that. Okay, Sarah, data driven decisions. What do we think? Is this a correlation? Okay. Okay. All very true statements. My people that were in stats, is this a correlation? There's two data points, so R squared is one. Yeah. So well, is there an R value? Is there a scatter plot? Well, because we're talking about VO2 max, they got the middle week runners at 77.4, and the college runners at 70.1, and then their mile time, that's a two point linear regression. Okay, I mean, I guess you could, you can't run regression on average values. That's a complete violation of all of the assumptions of regression, but I, your point is well taken, <laughs> right? You can do it, you shouldn't, but you could, okay? But that was my point, Sarah, was just the, I, people would look at this and say, well, look, clearly it has to be this. You're like, well, they don't want a correlation. How do we know? Look at the differences in VO2 maxes between or among the, the Olympic guys and then look at their best performances. And the, that doesn't even, those things don't even correlate particularly well with each other. Okay. Now, I do all of this and I say all of this to try to, to, try to just tell you guys a few things about VO2 maxes. Okay. Here are some additional data, and I don't know why I don't have the citation in here, but here is actual correlation or regression. One mile time, two mile time, six mile time, okay? And they're correlating these things with VO2 max down here on the axis. <coughs> so those VO2 max predict performance in these things, right? R squared, 
minus 0.84, minus 0.87, minus 0.88 in these things. So if you look at this, where there does seem to be a significant linear relation, negative linear relationship between how long it takes me to run certain distances and these things. But there's something really important in this, okay? What do we need if I artificially or non artificially yield, I guess? If I artificially want to cheat and make my correlations or my relationships better, what do I need my data to look like? People in stats. What helps? The endpoints. What about why does what are the endpoints? What matters? Well, deviation, right? If you want to cheat your correlations, have spread in your data. You need high values and you need low values, and then you can have all the number of people in the middle theoretically as you want. But if they're all right at about 60, they're all right here in the middle, you're not going to have a relationship because there's no variation to try to explain. And in that particular way. So if we look at this, what we know is that well if I'm at 50, which I'd love to be at 50 again. Okay. And then I'm out here at like 73 or 74, there's this vast difference between these two things. But if you look right here in the middle, right, I'm looking at everybody that's right around 60, it's this big cluster. So when there is sort of significant differences in VO2 max, they're going to be predictive of endurance performance. When everybody's roughly the same or within, you know, a couple of ml per kgs per minute of each other, it becomes much less predictive. So if anybody ever asks you, does VO2 max predict performance like everything else? The answer is, well, it depends, Dr. Black. I've got three people who are all at 50. No, VO2 max isn't going to matter. But if I've got somebody who's at 20 and somebody who's at 80, then hell yes, it matters. Okay. So other things, here's some correlations from these same data where they were correlating sort of things, sort of actual runtime fiber type composition, SDH activity. So this is a, a surrogate of mitochondrial function. Gabe can tell us if that's the, really the best way to do this. Probably not. And VO2 max. And what you will note is we look at this SDH activity, mitochondrial stuff, not that predictive of VO2 max. Fiber type composition, pretty good. Okay, More slow twitch fibers, higher VO2 max. And then you see the three things that are going to do all of this. Does SDH activity, does mitochondrial activity predict performance time? Not really. Does my one mile time predict my two mile time? Yeah, pretty good, right? And so on and so forth in, in those kinds of things. Fiber type composition is better than SDH activity, but we can make an argument on all of these things that these things are all going to be interconnected anyway. And we've got some collinearity from those that we've got into it, all right? But VO2, right, is of these things is one of our best predictors of performance. Okay, so it works, just not all the time. Just not all the time. All right. So here's part of what we just sort of I gave you guys grief about, right? Is it pulmonary diffusing capacity, right? There, based upon a host of different things. If you go to altitude, yes, maybe it is. At sea level, maybe less so. If you have emphysema, yes. If you don't, maybe not, All right? Is it what we call convective? So is it cardiac output? Come on, get mad at me if I said cardiac output is convective loosely, is just cardiac output. Ladies, what do y'all think? Would Kelowan be upset with me if I said that really we can in some ways sort of encompass convective components of VO2 by cardiac output and red cells or cardiac output and, and those kinds. Is that, is that okay? Yeah. It's generic. I need to be more specific. I'm not part of asking this now. <laughs> this, is, this is part of what in the, the older articles they talk about central limitations of VO2. It's a heart, okay, heart, lung, circulation versus the diffusive component, which is going to be our ability to get that oxygen actually into the skeleton. And I would argue that the, probably the most accurate answer is that it's some combination of all of these things 
together. It's not just convective. It may be convective in these people in this situation, or it may be diffusive in these people in this situation, or something like that. Okay. So. Wait, it's a random question. Yes, ma'am. Type one versus type two multipliers, uh, which would have a greater. Whichever ones have the most capillary density and mitochondrial density together would be my guess. So you could argue that maybe that could be two X's or two A's, I'm sorry, because you can get so many mitochondria if you were really well trained and you had a bunch of capillaries to those. The, the easier answer is probably to just say ones, but I, I can envision a scenario whereby you could argue that it could be the two. If you have to keep intracellular O2 concentrations low, so you need the mitochondria, then you need the ability to get a bunch of it into those capillaries. And so you need a bunch of capillaries. So okay. to keep the gradients, I don't know. Okay, fun things, all right? These are data looking at the effects of VO2max on breathing, okay? Normoxia, so about 21% O2, and like room air, and then breathing hyperoxic gas where you're getting an extra 5% of oxygen. Here are normal people. That are doing this, okay? No differences between these two conditions, which is suggestive that at least pulmonary diffusion is not going to be an issue, okay, in these people. We look at our highly trained people, though, and there's an issue, okay? They actually make their VO2 go, VO2 go up by giving them more oxygen. Now, is this indicative that they have a larger cardiac output or larger carrying capacity? For this extra O2, maybe. Is it indicative that carrying capacity is relatively equal, but these trained people have more mitochondria? And so now they can actually deliver more to their mitochondria. I think that's the more likely scenario. But again, here we have an artificial scenario where different people are going to experience different things in different conditions. Okay. I always joke with people that if you ever watch the football players that play in Denver, and they're like sitting on the sidelines and they've got, they've got the oxygen mask on that, that's doing literally nothing. Right? Literally nothing. Because they're not that depleted or, or anything else. I mean, they're going to just have to go back out there and play and they're going to go right back out. So, the mask on. so but this may be a, a pulmonary thing if you look at it in this way. Okay. Here's the, the famous data from. Australian rowel that I showed you guys before, O2 uptake, cardiac output, relatively nice linear distribution of things there. We've got men, we've got women, we've got highly trained, we've got untrained. Cardiac output very much correlates. Okay. So is this a central or sort of convective limitation? And so what we can, what we can see if we look at here, just three sort of people, we've got people that are doing bed rest, and then we've got sedentary people and then trained people that are going on here. They're trying to break this down. If you take a sedentary person, you have them do bed rest. The primary thing that they leave that makes their O2 consumption go down, in this instance, was a loss of cardiac output, primarily a loss of stroke volume. So that's the difference. Here's our baseline. These people lost to this point to get to here. Then when they train, you get a further, you get an increase in stroke volume above what these people have, and you're going to get some increase in increase in AVO2, which is likely going to be something on, on the muscle side. So if you peek at this, you're like, oh, well, it went up because of both. So which one is the limiting sort of factor in comparison to this person? It may be a little bit of both. So just some, some interesting ways to try to break down kind of what all is what all is going on here. This is stuff on carrying capacity, VO2, right? This is giving sort of acute blood transfusions. So you get 450 mLs, you get almost a liter, and you get almost a liter and a half on all of this, and we make VO2 max go up only at the very, very end one. Hemoglobin concentration is going to go up, right? If we're looking at these two things, 
and then hematocrit percentages are going up, but we only really see it at these very, very high levels. So that tells us that increasing total water, increasing drain capacity helps, but maybe, excuse me, not as much as, as some of the other things. Okay. I'm going to buy that made right there. I apologize. That slide should have been um, it should go all the way back with the critical power stuff, but really it should just be taken out. I thought I had taken it out. Um, here's your capillary to fiber ratio graphed against max VO2. Nice tight relationship. If you, if you ask me about this one. Okay. And so again, now we're able to get more blood to there. Is that able to, are we now able to use more of the cardiac output that we already have? Or are we able to actually make better use of the mitochondria that we have? In some ways, it doesn't really matter. Okay. Again, these are the kind of data that we have to try to parse ourselves through. Okay. So this was, this was in some ways meant to be, is it mitochondria? And if I look at the, the enzyme activity, if you look at SDH activity here, which I've already shown is not always the most highly correlative type of thing. But if you look at SDH activity and you try to correlate that against some of these other things, maybe if you scan hard enough, you can see some things. Okay. So it's just kind of a, a little bit of, of all of these things. So here was part of the, those experiments that we were having in Ethan Duke, okay, where we've got cardiac output, what's happening in sort of muscle blood flow when you do per muscle two leg cycling versus knee extensors of one leg. And so you can note that we're able to cram a huge amount of cardiac output basically into, um, into the one leg. So this is a model of trying to make sure that it's not going to be cardiac output that it's on the track. But we don't do this. Like in, in, in an artificial sense, we create this situation Okay, well, we can make it where it has to be a muscle side of the thing, or it has to be a pulmonary thing because of that, because we've limited it, we've, we've made it where you've got plenty of cardiac output. But this isn't what we do in everyday life. It's, you don't ride a bike with one leg. Right? I mean, I guess you could if you really wanted to, but we don't do this. This is kind of more of where we are in practical sense, and so we need to kind of understand what the things that we're going to do. Right. Chris? Really weird question. Okay. Would you say that, uh, say with, uh, what is called? Not special Olympics, but um, Paralympics. Paralympics, yeah. Would you say that somebody that is an MT would have a higher VO2 max single leg versus somebody with two legs? Um, I guess it would depend upon, I guess would normally be no. Okay. I would, it, it would depend upon what, what their actual like exercise was. Yeah. Because if you're, I mean, the, the sort of the real argument is you no, know, because they have less muscle mass, right? Yeah. So if, if, if you're an amputee, the VO2 is actually related to muscle mass engaged during exercise, but they have less muscle to engage. Now, if you're talking about on, an, on a per mass basis, if you normalize it out to what they do have, maybe, but it would all depend upon, right? Like what, what is it that they're doing? How are they able to train? Okay. So interesting question. Then there's the thing that we don't talk about with a lot of the Paralympians, at least the folks that run, that we're looking into a little bit of some levels now as we kind of go forward. It's this idea of gross mechanical efficiency. If you run on those blades rather than, than this, you're, you're, you're much more efficient. Did they right? do a study on that that said that HTP wasn't different? It all depends on which blades you have, like on the characteristics of those things. The shoes that the guys use when they run the two hour marathon are not commercially available. You can't buy those air flies, and they have, they have these really reactive sort of soles. Um, that are maybe not strictly street legal, let's just say, in the amount of flex that they have. But you know, you run and you get a little bit more propulsion out of them than you do on a regular commercially available shoes. And so you're able to transfer a sort of greater elastic energy to help you 
come forward for an energy to reach So instead so, of running, let's say cycling. Mm -hmm. What about cycling? If we compared a Olympian Again, cycler that has no bodily deformities versus a Paralympic that may be, say, missing his or her leg above the knee, and both are cyclists. It's going to come down to again sort of their efficiency. Okay. Like people that have shoe legs, everybody has very different mechanical efficiencies. Mm -hmm. Or I mean, probably we should call that economy, movement economy on the bike. Mm -hmm. Anyone's ever ridden a bike, right? We'll get Dr. Larson in here and she talked about how, yeah, sure, it's quad dominant, but she can use your knee extensors, right? As you push with one leg, you're pulling up with the other, right? There's a little bit of calf at the, when you get to the very, very bottom of the pedal stroke and those things. And some people are better at that than others, and they can transfer more of their force, just sort of exactly where it needs to be. Okay. Okay, so these were some, some interesting uh, kind of older data that are from Ed Coyle's lab that are not necessarily as, as pertinent now that we don't talk about lactic threshold quite so much. Um, before critical power became kind of the, the hot thing to use to predict performance, there was a lot of stuff about lactic threshold because we knew once you got over lactic threshold, that there was a reasonable chance that you might see in a very predictable manner. And so they were looking at sort of here's the time to fatigue running at 88% of VO2 max. These are some trained people. If you can run 40, 45 minutes at 90% of VO2 max, you're really freaking trained. Okay. But they had these people that had very high capillary densities and they seemed to kind of be set apart. They had higher lactic thresholds and things. Um, than, than some of the than some of the other ones are parallel that they have these high capillary densities. And so they were thinking that one of the reasons that maybe having we can, some people have higher lactic thresholds is because they have more capillaries, they can shuttle more, they can deliver more oxygen, that, that would be a whole interesting thing. Um, these are these are some some interesting data. Uh, that we published, gosh, it's been, it's been like 10 years ago now, it really kills me. Um, so do you want to see what spread does to a correlation or to a regression equation? Look at this, okay? People up here, people down there. Here we have men who are on the Georgia College cross-country team, and we have women that were on the Georgia College cross-country team. And so we measured their, their sort of race pace at their NCAA meet. So this is actual performance. And then this was, we measured their running velocity at their, uh, my student insisted upon calling it the anaerobic threshold, but it was really kind of right out the threshold. Um, he fought me over and over and over again on these things. But what we found basically was whoever ran the fastest at anaerobic threshold or at lactic threshold, that was very predictive of the NCAA race pace. Um, if, you, if you look at all of those people, um, this is helpful. It's very, it still works well in the men, the women a little bit less so than just one of them, irrespective of if you've got the six of them. Okay. So, this is uh, some other things that people have done in the midst of all this. But what we know probably is it's not so much about what your pace at, at lactic threshold is, it's just lactic threshold is a serotonin measure of critical velocity, right? You can go a little bit faster. So the last bit that I want to talk about before we sort of call quits on everything is if we, if we go by the idea, the old sort of joiner and coil idea of performance VO2 or what we would then call critical power or critical velocity is going to be sort of what is the pace? What's the oxygen consumption metabolic rate that you can, that you can stay at? And how does that get translated across into actual running speed or power output or something? And the part that we've not talked about that becomes really important in running is this idea of economy. So think of economy, it's like gas mileage in your car. All right? Gas mileage in your car. It's what is the speed you can run? What's the oxygen cost to run at a certain speed? You're going to run six miles an hour, it costs me 
30 mLs per kg per minute or something. If I'm going to run at seven miles an hour, it costs me 35, right? It's, what is the O2 cost? Different people, that's going to depend upon your running form, your body weight, your VO2. There's a lot of things that are going to kind of go into that contribution. And this is a place where people for a long time in the 80s and 90s focused on can we improve running economy so that people can go faster and perform better without ever altering their VO2, without ever altering their lactate threshold? Can we improve? Your running form, okay. And so, if you want to know about the things that contribute to running economy, we stole this from a um, from a general strength and conditioning research review article, and they want to talk about like all of these things that may in some ways contribute to to what all of these things are going to be. Like. There's biomechanics, there's limb morphology, there's muscle and tendon stiffness, there's your environment. Are you going to change these things when it's hot or when you're at altitude? How well trained are you? And what we've learned over the years is that plyometrics and resistance training is actually really good. Being stronger is good, and explosive is good for your movement economy. It's now why all the cross country runners and longer distance runners will actually do this. So they need to do power runs, which makes my dad, the marathon runner, the football coach, really happy. This is two favorite things work. Let's go run and let's just do some power runs. You're sad, powerful. You're happy, powerful. Right? Whatever's going on, your back hurts, do some powerful. It's good for you. So they've never done from the floor power plants. Mm -hmm. Really? They, they do plyometrics, they box jump. Oh, to the floor power plants. Very, very, very sort of. I have a love hate relationship with those things from high school. Okay, so. This is showing you, okay, this is O2 uptake, right, in two international caliber 10 kilometer runners. One person has good economy, black, okay, the other one has poor economy. Their VO2s are roughly equal, but what you can see is at a given running speed, a person with good economy is at a lower VO2 to achieve sort of 14 kilometers per hour, 16, 18 kilometers per hour. And so they're at a lower percentage of their max, therefore they're likely not at their critical velocity um, until they get to sort of a faster speed, right? Compared to this person because they're more economic. This is the same thing. You can again see people that have the same sort of max VO2, and it takes these people longer to get out here to their max VO2 because they're able, this is sort of the velocity that you to max, this is their pace, right? In meters per minute. So the bottom line, this person is more economical at any given running pace, they're going to use less oxygen in comparison to the other person. So therefore, they can go faster and faster before they get to their max, before they get to a set percentage of their max at which their critical running velocity might occur. So this is also a really, really important thing. Okay. You don't want to run doing this, do you? you run like waving your hands over your head or anything else, you want to make sure that all of your propulsive force and all of that energy use and force generation is going to be That's it. That's it. We could do a whole class just on the last sort of like whole entire course just on the stuff in the last section. Okay. That's, that's a, a brief sojourn through some of the things that contribute Yes, VO2 matters. Yes, fiber type matters a little bit. Yes, critical power and velocity really matters, but all of those things are also going to come into the economy. And questions, comments, concerns? Anything? Thank you. You're welcome.
been a while since the last one. This is probably my favorite thing to do over here, just to kind of talk at you guys. So I appreciate you guys listening and laughing at my sort of strange jokes and uh, those kinds of things, making me feel old some days, which is good. Uh, but I, I appreciate sort of the effort. I appreciate your attentiveness. And, so I wish those of you that aren't in our department that I may not ever see again, please come back and see us. We're here all the time. We're kind of fun. Apparently, you can go drink with Christina if you if you want to. I mean, probably after. <laughs> so, um, and those things. But if I can be of any help to you guys.